Well, I have a question. I, I broke my femur when I was 17 on the ice playing hockey. I've met um, surgeons and who have also broken their femur. And I was like, you know, I wish I could take the rod out of my leg because it just yeah. doesn't, it doesn't feel the same. It's, yeah. and then when you think big picture, my whole personal thing is like lasting, you know, like 70, 80. I want to be able to do what I do now, just maybe at a different intensity, but I want to be able to live and be, yeah. I assume there's going to be a big life expectancy increase in the next 20 years. So I want to just be able to go. But we've had surgeons say, you know, I, I had the rod taken out of my leg and and they're like, I wish I didn't. And I'm like, well, oh. mine feels weak. And they're like, well, mine is weaker than yours. You at least have metal in your leg. Uh, yeah, how do you feel yeah. about that? Because I get worried about the bone marrow, bone density long term, because that's a yeah. really important bone for health later in life. Yeah. So I would tell you the athletes who are involved in jumping, leaping, bounding sports, if they do have say a tibia fracture or a femur fracture and that thing is fixed with a rod. Sure. Very often they will feel there's sort of some deadness in that limb that's got that rod in there. Um, and it, I would say it's, I don't think anybody's ever really been able to measure whether that indeed exists, but Anecdotally, I've seen it, especially in, I took care of an NBA basketball team for 10 years. The Sacramento Kings, right? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so within those, that realm, every once in a while, those guys get a stress fracture. Usually it's their tibia. They get that thing rotted. It gets fixed. They just feel that they just can't jump and yeah. the leg just feels it's dead. It's not as their, responsive. Yeah, yeah. You take that nail out and then they go, boy, I feel like I'm back to where I was. I think for the average person, I think if you were riding a bike, you probably wouldn't notice it. But at that elite level where you need that extra one or two percent, I think having a, a nail in versus taking it out can make a difference in your in your career. And again, usually those jumping, bounding sports, they like to have those things out. Um, you worry about you brought up things like stress shielding and what happens to the quality of the bone if you got a nail in there. Yeah. Um, bone responds to stress like muscles do, you know, uh, if you don't, if that bone is not seeing stress and you see it in these athletes falling off their bikes now, they don't have stress, the bone quality goes down and they end up falling and breaking stuff. Theoretically, yeah, the bone quality is probably a little diminished with the nail in there. Um, it is, I'll tell you, it's rare that we take any of that stuff out in the, yeah. the average person. Um, We've heard them take hardware out of the spine and these very weird pain syndromes and people doing well, like with a fusion, but um, yeah. Wolf's law, you know, the bone, the bone will respond to the stress you place upon it. You know, I don't feel yeah. like my bone is that strong because yeah. it's being baby, you know, and, and, and because of that, that, I don't want to, from trail running to mountain biking, everything has to be, I'm just kind of being diverse, but, um, you brought up hardware where, you know, I know you, you focus mostly knee and shoulders. Is that right? Yeah. What about like a, a lower leg, you know, these lower leg fractures, we have some people that dislocate their ankle, tibial fractures, fibular fractures, and they do this hardware fixation where yeah. you hear of a tightrope procedure versus like a, a true hardware fixation. Do you have any opinion on that? Because we, we want to stabilize the syndesmosis, but we yeah. we don't want to lock lock it down, right? You know, and you see a lot of dorsiflexion type restrictions and yeah. contractions, and and it's really a, a hell of a challenge to fight that. Yeah, so you know, you talk about these ankle injuries. Um, ankle injuries sort of run a spectrum from you know ankle sprains, which is probably the most common sprain of a joint that. Uh, athletes have is ankle sprains. Yeah. Um, if you do sprain your ankle, there are ligaments around that you worry about. You got your anterior talofib, you got your calcaneofibular ligament, then you got your syndesmosis if you get a big, big sprain. Um, syndesmosis injuries, um, treatment for those has gone from fixation with either one or two screws yeah. and then having to at some point take those out. Otherwise, 
chances are they're going to fatigue the, the hardware will fatigue and break it fails anyways yeah it will yeah and then yeah. Uh, now they got these tight rope which is probably better because there's a little bit of play in the the sutures uh so it's more mimics what the the syndesmosis because there's going to be a little give with that but the thing you got to understand if you traumatize a joint joints don't like to see trauma um and if you have a sprain, a dislocation, um, that joint is not going to be happy. Generally, you will probably have be able to return back to what you want to do with a sprain or a dislocation. But when you start having fractures into the joint, like things like yeah. chelon fractures and that kind of thing, yeah. the outcomes from those are, are not promising. Most of those people end up having um, traumatic arthritis from the, the injury just because the it's very hard to restore the normal anatomy. And so, again, you sort of have this continuum from a sprain to something like a pilon fracture, which is a disaster. Sure. Um, and ankles put on, have a lot of stress. And sometimes, you know, with joints, if they do become arthritic from either overuse or osteoarthritis or trauma, yeah. sometimes you can replace them like hip joints and, and knee joints. They do well. They do well. Ankles will still. Will, we are still trying to figure out a good long-term uh, plan for traumatic, or I should say, arthritic ankles. You can't have ankle replacements, but they're kind of fragile when you look yeah. at them compared to knees and hips. So. Fusions in the in the foot, like the first toe, the ankle. I mean, those are those are tough. Yeah, tough future. And 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 with the knee, you know. When you before you have arthritic changes in the knee, you see a lot of these like a micro fracture technique trying to help. You know the cartilage has a really minimal or a lesser blood supply, yeah. and you're trying to whether it's aerate it or you know initiate some stem cell production. Yeah, are you using a lot of PRP and stem cell undifferentiated like technology? Just trying to are you putting like a, a bone and cartilage matrix in? Yeah. In these procedures, do you find the future of these type of procedures is preventing even the early degenerative changes? And yeah, so treatment of cartilage injuries is we're still trying to figure that out. Um, a lot of the hurdles that existed decades ago still exist today. So you have articular cartilage, which is made up of chondrocytes, and you can take a patient's articular cartilage and grow it in a Petri dish and end up with billions and billions of cells. But nobody's been able to figure out how to layer the cartilage in an appropriate way that can withstand compressive and shear forces. And then the other problem is nobody's been able to figure out how to sort of anneal or secure that cartilage down to the uh, sure. subchondral bone. Um, and those are really the, the the two issues that we continue to have, there are a lot of procedures out there that try to, again, sort of stimulate your body, want to grow back its own cartilage, or can you use cartilage that has been um, multiplied somewhere or grown somewhere, or is coming from a cadaver, can you put that into a joint where the defect is, and can you hold that down and cover it? If you look closely at, if you could do a histologic exam of that area where that cartilage has been placed in an attempt to repair the cartilage, it comes back as really fibro, fibro cartilage. It's not articular cartilage. Okay. And it's really the same result that you get from microfracture, which is where you poke holes in the subchondral bone. Sure which has a barrier, does not allow blood to go through unless you poke holes in it, you form this sort of fibrocartilage layer. And that's where Stedman made a big name for himself. He was kind of the first guy to figure that out. Yep. Um, we within orthopedics are still struggling to figure out how to replace cartilage. And again, there's a lot of procedures out there, which means that none of those procedures really work all that well. And we're still trying to figure out the best one. So we're really trying, we're still trying to, improve function and secondarily manage pain. I think function is always first, yeah. but um, until the day where they can say like a, a knee replacement or a hip replacement, you know, can they resurface the cartilage of the, you know, tibial 
tibial plateau or can they actually grow your own tissue until then is stem cell and prp and and secondarily like just like with the opiate crisis where they're not relying on those meds as much is there going to be a change in how inflammation in a joint is is managed you know where NSAIDs or or steroids but anti-inflammatories when we look back in 20 years were they too heavy-handed i mean yeah. anti-inflammatories can be very diagnostic for an inflammatory process but um yeah. they're not necessarily helping you heal you know we're going to focus yeah. on healing techniques more well i think that's where we're trying to figure out how to use stem cells and and, and prp and data within the last couple of years is showing that PRP may show some promise with the treatment of arthritis. Um, stem cells, and when I think of stem cells, yeah, I'm thinking of real stem cells. And sometimes, yeah, with under, underneath stem cells, people are saying PRP, there's sort of these, you know, different branches, but yeah, real stem cells don't seem to be beneficial, but PRP seems to, over the last couple of years, there's good research coming out that says it might be helpful in early onset osteoarthritis, which is sort of that wear and tear. And a good analogy is like a car tire. You're born with a car tire and over time that tire of the tread gets thinner and thinner and thinner. And that's sure osteoarthritis and that's where PRP might be beneficial. But then when you, you bring up anti-inflammatory medications, part of the healing process, steps of the healing process involves inflammation. Exactly. And yeah. so these anti-inflammatory medicines theoretically are slowing down the healing process because they're not allowing you to develop that inflammation. Within joints, some of the inflammatory products that you, you make are deleterious to the, the chondrocytes or the articular cartilage. Yeah. So people are still trying to figure out what that soup is within a joint that is important for healing of cartilage or maybe stimulating cartilage to, to grow and heal itself. But there's so many components to what's in that synovial fluid once you injure your knee that we don't really know. We know what those components are, but we don't know, gosh, the ratio of this to that or the sure. quantity of this to that and, and how to stimulate the cartilage yet. Um, Let alone someone's genetic predisposition. I mean, there's a whole, people respond differently to different you know, influences on their system. Do you use hyaluronic acid? Do you use like the Synvisc and yeah. to, to kind of restore the synovial fluid? And then do you pair do that with PRP and, and, and yeah. debridement type techniques? Well, I would tell you that the Orthopedic Academy um, has come up with a consensus statement for, for treating arthritis, osteoarthritis. And they got basically, there's four things that you do. One, first is you think about modifying your activities and minimizing the, the full weight bearing activities. Then you got the anti oral anti-inflammatory medications, you got injections, and then you got um, knee replacement. Um, when it comes to injections, you kind of got, at this point, I would tell you three options. You got um, PRP, Again, uh, data is suggesting that it might be beneficial, but it's kind of early on. Yeah. Hyaluronic acid has been around probably for 30 years when you think about it starting in Europe. The academy has kind of stepped away to some degree from endorsing it, but used to push it. Um, so I do use it, but it's sort of early onset arthritis, and especially in somebody who's young. So you're and restoring like, mechanical stress or yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, mean, I think a good way to look at it is it's a normal substance that your knee makes. Mm -hmm. As you start getting arthritis, this big macromolecule, hyaluronic acid, starts being produced in sort of these small chains rather than the big molecule. And so in young patients who have early onset arthritis, I think it's worth trying, but it is not being endorsed like it was in the past. Cortisone is the one that the Academy still endorses, um, but it's a strong anti-inflammatory medication and you really have to be careful and cautious using it. You wanna make sure that people have done other things because sometimes the thought is the carrier for the, the cortisone is probably um, uh, sort of deleterious to the chondrocytes and yep. may cause chondrolysis. So you just, 
I use it, I use it, but I use it sort of at end stage after people have tried other other things. But what what about a lower level like a diclofenac? Why don't they use that? I mean, because that's cortisone is such a strong anti-inflammatory. And yeah, I don't know. If, I don't know if intraarticular injections of diclofenac work. It's it's an oral anti-inflammatory medicine, and then you also got it as a uh, transdermal where you can uh, have a cream to rub it on yeah voltaren yeah voltaren you got it. it's known as voltaren um, which was which was a prescription only like four years ago and now I it's, over it's, it's over the counter and yeah. um i think it's worth trying I, yeah. I have a hard time fathoming that that molecule can cross your dermis um I mean, your, your skin is pretty impermeable. I mean, that's why you got it. So I tell people try it, but um, it may not work. <laughs> uh, do you prescribe Celebrex and um, these Occasion. other? Or, yeah. Um, Celebrex is a COX-2 inhibitor and it's basically like ibuprofen, Aleve, Advil, Motrin, um, but it just does not have the same sort of cause the same GI distresses that some of those other ones do. Um, so if people have tried the standard over the counter and they still have issues and their stomach has given them problems, uh, Celebrex is a, is a good option. Do you think um, when they're taking Advil, like in just a few days, we have patients say, oh, my, my stomach's irritated. Is that just the inflammatory cascade just being challenged and there's a change in their physiology and they don't feel well because of that? Because I assume a lot of the GI irritation is longer use, even weeks or months? No, the, the problem with uh, the anti-inflammatory medicines is they decrease the protective mechanism of your stomach to, I mean, you're producing a lot of acids in your stomach to digest fluid. You got to have some kind of protective barrier that does not allow that those acids to destroy your stomach. When you take these anti-inflammatory medications, you sort of uh, destroy that natural barrier that you have. And that's why Celebrex is used because it's a COX-2 inhibitor. So it is causing anti-inflammation anti sort of down the pathway where it is not getting involved with the protective issues that you have with your stomach. So if people, even within a day or two, if they're saying my stomach's bothering me, yep. they probably gotta be careful because they're tending toward getting an ulcer and that's not a good thing. Is that a blood? Is that a gut blood barrier or is that just a simple stomach lining? Like stomach lining kind of okay. stuff. Yeah. It will mess with your stomach lining. Yeah. Anti-inflammatories. And that's why Celebrex is, and um, I think Meloxicam may also yeah. be a COX-2 inhibitor. So you, you work with a lot of shoulders, I'm sure. Uh, impingement syndrome, subacromial impingement, debridement or decompression. Um, are we dealing with a lot of type two, type three acromions that are responsible for most people's chronic and acute rotator cuff tear? Obviously trauma. Can, yeah. Is that being managed in any different way? Are people, um, are surgeons more invested in trying to normalize the mechanical stress, like um, decompressing the acromion? Yeah. Before there's a lot of degenerative changes or a lot of like soft tissue changes. Yeah, so that's it's an interesting topic because the trend has gone from, you know, early on in my training, everybody got a subacromial decompression, distal clavicle excision if you were going in their shoulder yeah. for anything. Yeah. Uh, the pendulum is now swinging to where, unless somebody's got a big, you know, type two or type three acromion, they probably leave it if, and they, and they got shoulder issues and you're going in there to do something, you're probably, majority of people are probably leaving the acromion alone mm -hmm. and probably not doing much with the uh, distal clavicle unless they really have pain at their AC joint. Um, we've gotten a lot better at identifying other pathology that will cause shoulder pain. And a lot of that has to do with MRIs uh, yeah. and being able to identify rotator cuff pathology. Um, when it comes to rotator cuff issues, a lot of it is attrition. Um, I always t tell patients, look, it's like when you're a young kid, you got a big thick rope and over time that rope starts getting thinner and thinner and thinner <laughs> until after a while, it just it can't support the ability to raise your arm up. And it's just wear and tear. And 
your rotator cuff does not have a, anatomically does not have a real good blood supply. So yeah. all this micro trauma does not have a chance to heal itself. And over time it sort of catches up and that rope gets pretty thin. And that um, joint has a ton of motion. I mean, the, 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 the yeah. dysfunction and you see people even in their thirties and forties, just they're deconditioned to yeah. then go to the gym and do shoulder press or whatever. You no, know, you um, what we call shoulder dyskinesis, where yeah, scapular was, dyskinesis, where you yep. got it, and they start having certain movements in their shoulder, trying to compensate, and that there's sort of this cascading thing. And the shoulder joint itself is a pretty unstable joint, and so you really rely on a lot of muscle and soft tissue to work in synchronicity. And once one of those things sort of go south on you, you get this dyskinesis and it starts uh, cascading down shoulder pain, scapular, thoracic pain, AC joint pain. You gotta then try to identify where it all started. Do you see um, you know, your practice being influenced mostly in the future, say five and 10 years by technology getting better and better, the materials getting better yeah. or the techniques? Uh, I, I would tell you that orthopedic is a unique specialty in that there are a lot of techniques out there um, and it is um, also driven by uh, implants and the human body is pretty impressive at being able to heal stuff and there are techniques that you see kind of come and go um, mm -hmm. and it's sort of generational where implant companies will have some new device and there'll be a new generation of orthopedic surgeons that will see this and it seems to make sense and then um over Period years of time. experience you'll find that it doesn't work the procedures that we do and then the yeah. implants that we use so okay you know, like you brought up earlier this thing called wolf's law where bone responds to stimulus um and if it's not there the bone kind of melts away and there have been implants that have shown up you know every 10 or 15 years so it's a new generation of physicians where they seem to make sense but over time things like wolf's law kind of catch up to the implant the implant doesn't work okay loses um uh use but then it kind of comes back again because there's a new generation that hasn't seen the experience of the older older oh, i see Interesting. Um, things like slap lesions yeah which is you know superior labral anterior posterior posterior yeah um the technique and the technology has existed probably for about 20 years to fix these things. And when it first came up that we could fix them, everybody wanted to fix slap lesions. <laughs> um, we found out over time, it's probably important to fix a slap lesion in somebody who is making a lot of money throwing baseballs. But for the average person, it's probably best just to do a, either a tenotomy or a tenodesis of the long head of their biceps. And so we went from doing the tenotomy, tenodesis, to, okay, we can fix slap lesion, everybody gets the slap lesion fixed. Now we're back to sort of really tailoring slap lesion repairs to elite overhead throwing athletes. And the rest of the population we're doing um, tenodesis. So we've kind of gone, gone back. So again, orthopedics is one of those professions that very often is sort of driven by new techniques, technology, but, um, I think if you've been around for a long time, you find out the body's pretty good at healing itself if you just give it time. Yeah, because just in my career, the labrum has become such like a strong focus. And was it the peri uh, articular osteotomy or um, sorry, PAO um, of the hip, trying to manage yeah. dysplasia yeah. in the shoulder because there's so much range of motion in the glenohumeral joint, labral repairs. Um, I have a question for you with the double bundle of the ACL because yeah. it makes so much sense, but I, I, from what I understand, it's incredibly difficult to put us, you know, an ACL has two bundles, yeah. but when it's repaired, it's repaired with one bundle, which, yeah. which controls the anterior posterior drawer yeah. instability, but it doesn't change the rotational instability. Is that a big goal of the profession to try to, improve I, I, they don't have good outcomes from what i understand a double bundle repair right no i think that's one of those techniques that kind of has come and gone um 
over time, we did realize that there are two bundles. You got the anterior medial and the posterior lateral bundle up for your, your ACL. And one is important when your knee is in extension. The other is more important when your knee is in flexion. Yeah. So the goal was with this double bundle to try to reproduce the normal anatomy. Yeah. Um, where those bundles attach on your femur is sort of a, it's a big footprint where both those bundles attach. And uh, in the, uh, gosh, probably 15, 20 years ago, Freddie Fu out of Pittsburgh mm -hmm. really pushed this double bundle technique and everybody was trying to do it. It's technically demanding, but the outcomes were not any better than just doing a big graph that just kind of covered that footprint where those two bundles were. And we've kind of now gone back to reproducing just a single uh, bundle, single bundle, but we've gotten a lot better technically in putting that bundle in the proper spot on the femur, which was a struggle because we just didn't have the um, technical ability. We didn't have the equipment that sure. allowed us to do it, but now we have flexible reamers. We have uh, retro reamers, things like that, that allow us to really put that bundle on the femur in the precise spot, because that was the, the technical uh, flaw that we had in some of the early arthroscopic techniques for fixing ACLs. But there's still increased, um, maybe because of the trauma, the degenerative changes of the knee, even with a single bundle, are, are still a challenge long-term? Long-term, yeah. Because of that know, rotational you, instability. Yeah, if you, we know that if you tear your ACL, whether you have that thing fixed or not, yeah. 10 years down the road, you're probably gonna start developing some knee pain with activities. Um, the biomechanics of the, the knee joint, it's not a simple hinge. Um, your femur actually kind of rolls back on top of your tibia when you bend your knee. And even though we give you a stable knee after fixing your ACL, which probably slows down some of those degenerative changes, mm -hmm. um, it does not stop them. And so sure. whenever I'm fixing somebody's ACL or running into a patient that needs an ACL fix, I just kind of caution them that if you got a choice between going for a bike ride or going for a run, it might be important to think about going for the bike ride rather than running because your knee's going to get a little achy on you down the road. We'll give you a stable knee, but it's not going to be as good as it really was before. You mentioned Dr. Stedman in, um, in Colorado. Do you know Dr. Mark Philippon? Because he, he's one of the doctors that really, especially in skating sports, he's Canadian, I believe, yeah. in uh, just labral pathologies and identifying like, um, you know, labral repair, like options. Yeah. Um, are you familiar with his work? Is yeah, no, I know um, Dr. Philip well. Um, he is the one who has really been the pioneer of femoral acetabular impingement. Mm -hmm. And um, he's, gosh, he's, I was at UC Davis and he came and gave a grand rounds there. This was 25 years ago. Um, and really has been the pioneer when it comes to treatment for femoral acetabular impingement with debridement of either the, the neck of the femur or the acetabulum and or labral repairs. And yep. uh, if you are heading down that direction as a practicing physician, um, you would hope that you'd have the chance to spend some time with him and learn his techniques. Yeah, I've listened to him in California where I did my residency and he, just the cam and the pincer mechanism and yeah. It's very, very interesting for rehab. You know, there's a limit of what we're going to do with it, but from a, you know, prehab and treatment, just trying to minimize that impingement stress and, and, yeah. uh, and, uh, you know, you did a residency in, in Birmingham. Was that with Dr. Andrews, the famous James, um, James yeah. Andrews. Yeah. And, and yeah. he's known for a ligament repair more than anything of the shoulder and knee. Are you, yeah. are you, practicing in a similar way as he does and did? Yeah, no, he, I still consider him a mentor. Um, Dr. Uh, uh, Bill Clancy was also there, who was sort of the godfather of ACL reconstruction. But sure. um, both those guys were big into soft tissue repairs, especially with shoulders. And um, they're very instrumental in like uh, soft tissue labral repairs. That was really their goal was to sort of recreate the native anatomy used in the soft tissues that existed. Um, 
So yeah, the shoulder, then, the shoulder labral. Is yeah, that exactly. Yeah, the shoulder. Yeah. And then uh, Dr. Andrews was uh, one of the pioneers in ulnar collateral ligament reconstructions for elbows. So, and that's the the Tommy John. Is that Joe? Yeah. Was it Joe yeah. who did that? Yeah, in yeah, Calif exactly. California, I think. Yeah. yeah, those two guys kind of put their heads together. Uh, Joe was probably the first guy to really to perform it on an elite athlete, uh, Tommy John, and had a yeah. good outcome. Um, but uh, he and Dr. Andrews and a couple other I think I contemporaries lost, yeah. at that time were the ones who really uh, looked very hear. closely at the biomechanics. You can hear me. Yeah, from what I understand, he he uh, he saved Tommy John's career, and it's changed a, a whole sport. You know, pitchers have a future, yeah. and um, we meet some kids that have had multiple ulnar collateral repairs at in high school, and you know, good, and. Uh, yeah. First thing you hear is people are like they shouldn't be throwing uh, yeah. curveballs, and I'm like, well, they probably shouldn't only be playing baseball their whole childhood. Yeah. One, more, one more question for you, um, and it, it goes back to the Tour de France in that race in '86. Lamont was there with, I believe, a partially a bike made partially of, of carbon fiber. Was that actually as big of a change in the in the industry and in the sport as I'm assuming? Um, or did it obviously his team was really good, but yeah. Um did has cycling really had a big bump in, in because of the technology? Um we have like three mountain bikes and it's 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 crazy yeah. how 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 much science is in them. Yeah. Yeah, but, you know, back when the monitors racing. Steel bikes were kind of the standard. Um, people were making aluminum bikes. There's a company called Elan, which is all aluminum. Okay. Uh, there is Exxon, which was making a sort of composite aluminum and carbon fiber. Mm -hmm. There were big issues with um, how to glue the different um, frame parts of the frame together because there were different stresses and strains that those um, materials <laughs> could compensate for and yeah um so there's a sort of a mismatch but a lot of us were using sort of uh early composite aluminum uh carbon fiber frames uh for someone like me who is large it was not probably the best um option because steel is just a lot more uh consistent and better for larger human beings the, the other stuff was pretty fragile okay but light I could ask you a million questions but thank you very much uh i assume yeah. you'll be watching the rest of the trials this week or this yeah. weekend and then um i'm sure you'll be watching you're not going to the olympics i assume because of covid or uh, i don't think anybody's going to go to the olympics yes. um but no i'm watching the trials and it looks like the american team has a lot of depth to it so i think they have good chance of being successful in a couple of weeks in, in Beijing. When you see a 17 year old Jordan Stoltz doing <laughs> well, does that remind you of you? It brings back memories. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, he's done very well, sort of the shorter distances, which is something that I did. Um, and then as you, as you matured, you really sort of started to understand and get, uh, psychologically uh trained for some of the longer distances and i've had a chance to talk with his coach a little bit and he feels very confident that as this uh as jordan's career progresses he's going to have the opportunity to do well at say you know the 1500 meters and maybe some of the longer distances in the 1500 how do you describe that race is it is it the hardest race oh. um it, it, it's a it's an interesting race because you have sprinters and and long distance skaters coming together and competing in the in the same distance. I think physiologically the hardest race is probably the five thousand because okay. you're on the limit for twelve and a half laps, fifteen hundred meters. If you're a good long distance skater, um, yeah, I mean everybody suffers the last <laughs> lap. Sure, I mean, that's just just part of it and. Uh, you're very anaerobic, but with the uh, over the last probably decade, the 5,000 meters has really become an anaerobic race in and of itself. And um, 
it was a race that always challenged me. And I, and when you talk with some of the physiologists that are involved with speed skating, you would probably say the 5,000 is the most demanding. Did uh, your last race in 1980 was the 500, I believe. In uh, the 80 Olympics was 10,000. 10,000. Yeah. And uh, you had told me you were up late that night yeah. because the, the men's hockey team won. They yeah. were, they beat Russia and you were Russia. very, you were friends with them and, yeah. and you were up pretty late and uh, yeah. you woke up and pounded a gallon of water and, <laughs> and, and you were, you know, you weren't well prepared, I guess, going into that race. And uh, yeah. uh, is that accurate? Is that what happened? And, and can you explain what it <laughs> felt like to watch your friends, the team beat the Russians in 80? No, it was, um, I grew up playing a lot of ice hockey. And um, when I was 16, I had to choose between ice hockey and speed skating. Speed skating went out, fortunately. So I knew two of the players very well because they grew up, we grew up together in the town of Madison. And I knew some of the others from playing against them in uh, Minnesota and out on the East Coast. Okay. And so it was fun watching them because they basically played on my off days. I was racing every other day and every other day those guys were playing. So I got to see all hockey games and um the night before the 10,000 uh the U.S. played Russia and I was able to watch that game and I ended up oversleeping the next morning and um <laughs> yeah and you know when you're an athlete you usually have a pretty set pre-competition routine routine and yeah uh, I like to be at the rink two hours before my race to get everything ready sharpen my skates warm up um, sharpen skates again, that kind of thing. And yeah, gosh, two hours before the race, my coach is knocking on the door at the Olympic village going, where are you? We're sitting on the car waiting for you. And so yeah, I scrambled around to the cafeteria, grabbed a couple pieces of bread and had to kind of shorten up my pre-race routine. And, um, the race, I was paired against a guy, a Russian who held the world record and, yeah. um, the skaters before me were all coming very close to the world record. And so I knew I was going to have to skate a very fast time. And I had already won four races and was mentally getting pretty fatigued. Yeah. And it took me a couple laps of that race before I really was able to focus and get on with doing, doing things. But, um, was that an Olympic record? Cause I think you have one world record in four yeah, that Olympic, was Olympic records. and world record. Uh, nice. that day. Crazy. No, it, was, it was a great way to leave Lake Placid, you know, step off the ice with a world record in the 10,000 meters. And wow, I've always looked up to those who could skate good 10,000 meters and, um, boy, to do it at, at Lake Placid and to set a world record was something that I just, I never thought would happen. Um, and it was just a great way to end my career. Well, you, you obviously had a great career and medical and, and as a, as a speed skater. So thanks for everything you've done for the sport. You're, you mean you know, a lot to us speed skating. You mean a lot to the Olympic, you know, feeling in the U S and um, I wish I was sitting next to Al Michaels at that game, <laughs> you know, that would have been cool. Thank you so much. All I right, appreciate Eric. it. And um, we'll, we'll see you down the road. All right, Eric. Yeah. Thanks. See you later. Appreciate Bye. it. Have a good rest of the Bye. day.